So after searching far and wide for a uh, dry erase marker that will work, I want to uh, briefly diagram some of the conceptual machinery that uh, Kant is trying to articulate uh, with his new transcendental method of epistemology. Um, I want to show the transition from the pre-Kantian correspondence theory of the mind's relationship to the world and the way that the mind comes to know the world, um, the, the transition from that to, to Kant's transcendental approach. So let's say that here we have the human mind and over here we've got some objects hanging out in the world. Now, um, I'm going to uh, shamelessly uh, generalize here about the history of philosophy, but for pre-Kantian empiricists, the idea was that, um, say, you know, for Locke, for example, there's nothing in the mind that wasn't first in the senses. So we come to know about objects uh, in the world through our sensory experience, right? Um, we, we learn everything from sensation. And only once we've uh, experienced things in the world and brought them into our mind um, do we start to have ideas about them. And once they're in the mind, we can you know, perform all sorts of uh, logical operations in here, relate them to one another, combine them, um, decompose them, rearrange them, and so forth. But for empiricists, um, nothing is in the mind that wasn't first in the senses. Now, for pre-Kantian uh, rationalists, like, let's say, um, let's just go back to Plato, but this would also be true for Leibniz, for Spinoza. Um, when we think we're looking at objects, like real objects out there in the physical world, we're actually only seeing pale imitations of eternal forms uh, that exist up here in uh, sort of platonic heaven. And right, these are all like shiny uh, and radiant because these are the true essences of the pale imitations that we perceive with our physical senses. And uh, for these pre-Kantian um, rationalists, there's a sort of um, baked in theological presupposition that through some divine decree, the human mind is, is uh, provided with these, uh, provided with access to these uh, eternal forms, right? So when we come to know about the world, we're not actually learning it through sensory experience. We're rather, as Plato would, would describe it, we're remembering the eternal forms uh, as they exist prior to um, or independently of the physical world. And it's the, our sensory experience of the imitations of those ideas that kind of um, reminds us of their true essence that, again, is not in the, the things themselves, but that we intuit um, in this sort of an intellectual intuition of, of the eternal forms. So, uh, and in this, this whole pre-Kantian picture, um, you know, space and time are sort of taken for granted as something that we're inside of. And um, there, there wasn't too much explicit inquiry into their nature and how mind, in fact, relates to them. With Kant, we've got uh, a reversal of this traditional sort of correspondence uh, understanding, correspondence theory of knowledge. Kant is still a rationalist of sorts, right? So um, we come into the world with these innate ideas pre-installed, uh, right? So he's still a Platonist in that sense. And he basically just lifts his categories of understanding and uh, the logical relations thereof from uh, Aristotle's uh, table of categories that's, that was 2,000 years old at the time. Um, and, but what Kant does, the, the revolutionary move that Kant makes is to reverse um, the relationship between subject and object, such that rather than saying the subject or the mind must conform to the way that objects appear in the world, um, instead, the objects as they appear in the world must conform to the subject, to the structure of the subject, to the mental activity of the subject. And uh, furthermore, 
in the Kantian picture, we're no longer sort of just unproblematically placed within space and time, but rather uh, space and time are themselves just forms of intuition uh, that our mind projects uh, or constructs. So space and time are a function of our own sensory organs. They're the way that our sensory organs come to perceive the world. Um, rather than the way the world is in itself, right? So for Kant, all of our knowledge of objects is limited to the phenomenal realm. And what there is beyond the phenomenal realm, we can't say anything about other than that it exists. And so this is the realm of things in itself, or as Kant also refers to it, uh, the noumenal realm. And um, you know, if you'll recall Hume's critique of the um, necessity of causation um, was uh, a critique that, as Kant put it, awoke him from his dogmatic slumber and led him to uh, articulate this new framework wherein um, instead of causality having to be something that we would learn about through experience of the world, causality is one of the innate ideas or categories that our mind uses to understand the world, and it applies only in the phenomenal realm, right? That is provided by our own sensory organs, way of organizing perception uh, in, in space and time. Now, as we'll see as we move forward uh, into uh, the post-Kantian German idealists, uh, like Fichte and, and, and Schelling and Hegel, they will um, point out the way in which Kant ends up contradicting um, the rules of his own transcendental method. Because if causality is one of the categories that the mind uses to understand uh, its experience of the, the phenomenal world, it can't be a category applicable to the noumenal realm. And Kant will sometimes slip up and say that this noumenal realm of things in itself which does exist beyond our experience, because he doesn't want to be uh, you know, understood or mistaken for a kind of um, idealist like uh, Bishop Barclay, right, who said that um, to be is to be perceived, and that um, all of reality is just perception, and there's nothing behind perception. And when I'm not looking at the wall behind me, it's only God perceiving it that keeps it in existence. Kant didn't want to um, be that kind of an idealist, so he had to posit this noumenal realm. But when he says that the noumenal realm is somehow the cause of our phenomenal experience of, of, of apparent objects, he's applying a phenomenal category of causation. It's only supposed to uh, be applicable to this realm in order to understand this realm, the noumenal realm. right? So he's overstepping the bounds of his own transcendental method. And uh, Fichte and, and the other post-Kantian idealists will take this not as a sign that the whole Kantian project has failed. Rather, what they'll try to do is move forward with the spirit that Kant should have in, uh, well, always intended, rather than the letter, which, in fact, in the letter of Kant's own writing, he does contradict himself. But they want to carry the Kantian spirit uh, forward into this, what they will call, absolute idealism where the line between the phenomenal and the noumenal realms becomes a bit more porous, as we'll see. Um, but that's sort of a sneak peek for subsequent modules. Um, I hope this uh, helps elucidate some of what Kant is up to uh, with his new transcendental method. So. <laughs>